Welcome everyone to today's LinkedIn webinar. My name is Michelle Rapp from the Office of Alumni Relations, and I'm the Associate Director for Alumni Career Strategy, bringing these kind of programs to you. And we're always interested in topics that may be of interest, so please do feel free to let us know about that. We're delighted to have Sabrina Woods here with us today as our expert presenter, and some of you may have known Sabrina during your time at Northeastern. Just want to tell you a little bit about her background. Sabrina Woods is a holistic career and life coach, LinkedIn trainer in private practice, and a career coach at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Previously, she was an associate director in the Career Development Office at Northeastern for 15 years. In her private practice, she uses holistic approaches while working with individuals who are going through career transitions. One of Sabrina's specialties is facilitating workshops on LinkedIn. She uses her LinkedIn expertise to teach train the trainer sessions for career services professionals and has also facilitated workshops in the US, UK, and the Middle East. Additional presentation topics include stocking your career toolkit and using mindfulness to handle everyday stress. Sabrina is an alumna of the Demore McKim School of Business and we're delighted to have her here today. Thanks so much, Sabrina. Great. Thanks so much, Michelle. It's really a treat to be talking with fellow alums, given that was uh, where I was when I was doing my business degree uh, a few years back. I am really tickled to be talking about this topic. Uh, I'm going to share with you some personal stories, and hopefully I'm going to bring to life LinkedIn. It's so much more than just a resume or a CV online. And I'm really delighted that I also have this opportunity to teach LinkedIn in lots of different places, um, ranging from different parts of Harvard University. I'm a part-time coach at Harvard Chan School of Public Health, and I've been teaching LinkedIn there just last week to students and alumni, among other places in the Boston area and abroad. So um, I just wanted to say this quick hello to you on video. In a few minutes, I'm going to switch over. I'm going to share some information via PowerPoint. And then we're going to go for our more technical sort of um, networking strategies. We're going to go right to LinkedIn itself. And hopefully you'll be able to see well enough. The screen I know is a little bit small sometimes. But we're going to hopefully give you some uh, advanced tips in the later part of this program. The other thing I want to say is I really want this to be beneficial to you. So don't be shy about asking questions. Um, they're going to come into Michelle. And every once in a while, I'm going to stop. And I'm going to see where are we at. And if the question's not related to what we just covered, I'm totally fine with that. So go for it and ask them. If at the end of the program we haven't covered your question, I have a personal invitation to you to connect with me on LinkedIn and ask that question that way. If you need a LinkedIn profile review, um, what you're going to be able to do also is take that question to the Career Center where I used to work um, or, or also I think Michelle might do some of that individual work. I'll leave her to say whether she does or not. But just know you also have resources as an alum back in the Career Development Office. Okay, at this point I'm going to say uh, goodbye video wise and jump into PowerPoint and I look forward to hearing your questions in a little bit. All right, so let's dive in. Let me share a little bit about what we're hoping to cover today. As I said earlier, I want to bring this tool to life a little bit more and help you see some of its value. We're going to briefly cover a few topics within the profile, but we're really going to focus more on the networking aspect and the job development and lead development and um, growing your career connections. So we'll be talking about building connections, We'll do a side conversation about informational interviews, and then we'll talk about what can be some of your strategies to grow your network within groups. Here are a couple of quick facts and stats about LinkedIn. I constantly have to update this slide because they're growing so frequently. Just the other day, a few days ago, I changed the slide to 540 million because I had it at 500 million and had to get it updated. So really robust. And languages. Last time I had 22 languages, we're now up to 24. So let, let's just give you some examples of how LinkedIn's been beneficial. 
I got this message in my LinkedIn inbox and it put a huge smile on my face. Um, I had worked with um, an individual named Kian and she wrote to me and said that she landed this postdoctoral fellow uh, position at Santa Fe Genzyme um, and she says that she thinks the help that I did with her about her LinkedIn profile made the difference, especially because she actually applied using her LinkedIn profile. There are organizations now that say you don't have to send a resume or CV. You can actually hit this button and have your entire LinkedIn profile be your application. So keep that in mind when you're looking at job postings and then also just realize how valuable it is to pay attention to your profile. Um, this is a fun story because it involves some colleagues. So uh, this was from several years ago, actually, but it's just a fun story that um, Anne came to me because she was applying for a job at Fisher College. She could tell from LinkedIn that I was connected to the director at that career center. And the director at the time was Heather. So she said, do you know Heather well enough to let her know I've applied for the job? Well, luckily, I had recently met Heather at a conference, and so I was able to send a quick note along and let her know that um, Anne had applied. So a few interviews later, Anne ended up landing the job at Fisher College. Now, I'll also add that several weeks or maybe several months after that interchange happened and Anne was working there, I saw Heather at another networking event. And she said to me, oh, by the way, I didn't even have to uh, screen or Google search Anne because she came recommended from you. So there's just this added value when someone, you know, you know someone to be able to promote your candidacy. Oh, one more story, but this is more in the land of networking. So the idea behind this is it's not just about landing jobs or making connections to help you land jobs. It can help you in so many other ways. So here's the story. I noticed one day in a LinkedIn group that this person, Jim Peacock, was running a webinar for career counselors. The topic was happenstance theory. I was so excited about it, but I couldn't attend this free webinar because I was already teaching a workshop myself. What I did say to Jim in a quick message back was, this is a great offering and I'd love to help you market it. I was trying to explain some things in the chat box in the group and it was too hard. So I said to him, I'm happy to talk with you for a few minutes on the phone because I've got some tools on LinkedIn that you can use to better market your program. So the attitude I have when it comes to networking is, how can I help? So I chatted with Jim for five or 10 minutes that day to help him. Then we continued to see each other's posts in this small LinkedIn group. So I got to know him a little bit through those two means. Now, fast forward about nine months, I was actually being considered for my first keynote for a conference, which was really exciting. I ended up landing that particular opportunity to be the keynote, and I later found out Jim happened to be the president of that professional association. I didn't even realize it because I was working with the conference committee. Now, you can only imagine when the conference committee forwarded my name about this keynote, the Jim had to readily agree or possibly even say, yes, I'm interested because he already knew me and he knew also my level of expertise from some of the things that we'd shared. I didn't set out to try and use LinkedIn to land a keynote. It's just something that came about because of my robust networking and my attitude, how can I help? So hopefully that inspires you a little bit about what's possible. Now, we're gonna dive in and um, Definitely type in questions as they pop up. I'm going to stop in a few minutes, but we're going to dive in and talk first about headline. Headline is that content right underneath your name. So for me, holistic career coach, higher ed professional, LinkedIn trainer, collaborator and connector, and mindfulness practitioner. So I've got a question for you. I'd love to find out, have you customized that section right underneath your headline? I'm going to pause and let Michelle pull up, Michelle and Diana pull up a poll for us. Let's find out how many of you 
actually have that professional headline customized. If you don't customize it, it will end up being just your current job title. That's sort of the default mode. Okay, Sabrina, we have 18 yes and 11 no. Oh, 19 okay. yes. <laughs> 19 yes. All right. That's pretty good. So we have about two thirds of you who've customized it and one third who haven't. So for those of you who have, kudos, that's fantastic. And you, I'm gonna show you a couple of additional examples. So even if you've already customized your headline, let's think about whether or not you're truly maximizing those 120 characters. So here's some examples first off. Communications professional, writer and editor of online content, event planner. If I were just to put my job title, it might say, you know, um, marketing manager, or it might, or, or sorry, communications manager, which says so little compared to what we have here. With this next one, a research scientist at Boston Children's Hospital would say very little. It's just, just really the job title and where you're working. But then we're adding in this specialized in immune responses in inflamed tissues. So that people can really get a sense on, well, what is that person focused on or what is their specialty area? A few more. Um, one of my former clients in my private practice came up with this one or we came up with it. Finance and operations executive grows financially strong organizations by going beyond the numbers. She has a real sense of um, relationship building that goes on with the teams that she grows. And so I thought this was a really nice way for her to kind of say, it's not just about the numbers, she sees a bigger picture. And here's one more, sustainability specialist focused on economic performance, urban renewal, and energy efficiency. My hope for you is that when I see your headline, I'm gonna know a bit about who you are for in your professional life, a little bit about what your specialty area is, or something that differentiates you from others that are in your field. So think in terms of either an interest or focus area or highlight a specific skill or a couple of skills. Make use of that 120 characters so that people can get a, that, um, that splash of who you are without even reading any further. Okay, next part we're gonna talk about just briefly is your summary. Your summary is your opportunity to tell your story. Your summary, um, how do I want to say this? We normally think of a summary as summarizing our past. But what I would like you to reframe it as is I want you to pull from your past and your current experiences that best target and fit with where you're headed next. So it's a positioning statement. If I just summarized my past, then I, you'd see a lot of words like resume, cover letter, interviewing. And I know you can't see my full summary here, but I'm a career coach and I don't even have the words resume, <laughs> cover letter, or interviewing. The reason is there are other things I want to focus on for how I want to be in the world now and moving forward. And so I let go of some of those basics and instead really specialized my content to where I'm heading. So let's um, find out from you. Do you have at least a few sentences in your summary? Or have you said, oh, this is tough and you haven't actually worked on it yet? So we'll pop up a poll and find out where you're at. Okay, we've got 16 yes and nine no. And also just to let folks know that if they do want to ask questions, you're able to participate by chat. So if you click on the purple menu icon on the bottom right hand corner, and then you'll see the chat bubble. And that's where you can ask questions at any time. Perfect. All right. So we have some opportunity for those nine of you to think about what you want to put in your summary. And I'm going to show you an example summary so that you can actually, I'm going to first show you um, kind of a format. This is the format that I've used for my summary. There's so much flexibility with our, our background and our summary sections. 
And so seeing and looking at other people's is a great way to get inspired and, and, and kind of decide on a format that works for you. This one has an opening statement, and then I'm able to have details on three sections. So I can highlight my coaching, I can highlight my retreat and workshop facilitating, and then I can highlight the fact that I do, I do these LinkedIn trainings. This way I'm kind of, even if people just glance briefly at it, they get a chance really quickly to see um, what I'm about. The other thing I want to pay, pay, have you pay attention to is my summary and my headline support each other. So what you have in your headline is then important content to elaborate on down below. You want those to be kind of part of that universal brand, if you will. Now let's take apart, um, let's take apart one of these summaries. And if you needed sort of like, oh, some sort of template, just to at least get yourself started, this might be some options. You might have an opening statement like this one here about this research scientist working within neural activity and how it motivates and shapes human behavior. Uh, Jessica's next section goes on to talk about her skills. She brings to life that she does data analysis, interpretation, um, development and implementation of research tools. And then she has this other little kind of more lighter statement that says, oh, you know, I love to generate new ideas and devise feasible solutions to broadly relevant problems. One of the things that differentiates a summary on your resume from a summary on LinkedIn is that you can actually show your personality. So Jessica was able to kind of bring out the fact that colleagues and other individuals would probably describe her as driven and resourceful. Someone who has this really proactive and, and glass half full positive type person, especially when faced with adversity. And if you think about it, you think about a research scientist, you need to have that perseverance, don't you? You need to have that positive attitude, or it certainly can help you when you're working on projects that, that take a long, especially a long investment of time and resources. The way Jessica closes is she talks about how she's open to opportunities that allow her to use her diverse skill set and promote technologies that benefit human health. And she likes to kind of reiterate the fact that she's interested in data analytics, biotechnology, and pharma. So these are, these are just some options in terms of you thinking about what could be a potential format. In, um, in a little bit, when we go to LinkedIn, when we, when we leave the PowerPoint kind of structure, I'll also share with you from my website that I have some questions that you can ask yourself that'll break down how to develop a summary. So um, uh, Michelle, remind me if I forget, how's that? When we go there, I'm gonna just wanna share those questions with you and even some before or after summaries. So later on, you'll have some more resources that you can check out if you haven't had a chance yet to do your summary. Um, let me check in before I start talking about career changers just to see if any questions have popped up yet. Absolutely, we've got a bunch of questions here. Um, one is, do you, you know, do you have a preference between paragraph format or bullets? And also, how long should the summary be? Oh, great questions. All right. Um, so I remember one time I was working with a uh, Harvard Medical School postdoc, and he had this huge block of type. And I was way over, overwhelmed because it was, it was so long. So what I'm going to say first off is if you use the paragraph style, then make them short paragraphs, no more than three sentences, I would probably say. So realize they'll be short and concise. And then your option is also to use a combination of paragraphs plus some bullets. So I think what's really great is to look at other people's profiles and see what style you like best. And then mm, I'm trying to remember the number of characters. You know what, I think it's 2,000 characters. If you look at my profile summary, just go to Sabrina Woods on LinkedIn, I've maxed out my, um, my summary. It's as big as it can be. Now, two schools of thought. I've read so many different um, posts from link fellow LinkedIn trainers. There is one school of thought that says, be short because our attention spans 
Well, you know how our attention spans are. <laughs> they're, um, they're getting shorter, aren't they, as, as technology steps in and visuals take over and things like that. So a lot of people want to really quickly skim and see content. So one school of thought is to be very short with your summary. Another school of thought is maximize the full content of your summary because there are algorithms that are picking up keywords. So you can choose between which school of thought that you, that you prefer. So let me jump in and see if there's some more questions before we go on to some other parts here. Yeah, so two related questions. One is, how do you write your summary when you're changing careers? But we also have someone who is going back to a career that she did a while ago. Okay, oh, I like this. Um, well, that's perfect that you talk about career changer because up on the slide I have right here is I think it's great for you to tell your story about your changing of careers. So um, what is it that got you excited about this new career um, so that you can kind of leverage your story and, and, and your motivation for, for making this change and what you're hoping to do in this new one. And then you want to support this career change with any of those transferable skills that are going to be beneficial in that new role. Um, then let's see, past recircling back from a past career, I think that your summary is going to be a great place for you to be able to talk about your early work in this setting. And you don't really need to, you know, say the time frames when you're talking about this in the summary section. And then you want to probably also add how have you stayed current or how have you gotten back into the industry with your knowledge? So are there professional associations that you've joined? Are there volunteer projects that you've done that are related? Um, you know, what, we want to make sure that you're, you're, uh, you're leveraging any of the knowledge you have from the past as well as things that you've done currently to you know, kind of jump back into that field. Let me share with you a headline I really like from Vita. This is an individual who is an attorney making a career change into HR. And she writes for her headline, solving your employee relations challenges and bringing legal expertise to your human resources team. So I love this example of leveraging those transferable skills and also this really valuable skill um, of this legal expertise is going to be a great asset to an HR team. Okay, any more questions or should we continue on? Sabrina, the last question is about whether you're writing your summary in the first person or the third person uh, grammatically. Oh, great. I'm so glad that one got asked. I, I'm, I'm funny. I'm actually kind of picky about this. <laughs> and I, you, this is only an opinion, but I personally don't like it when people talk about themselves in third person. Sabrina Woods is an expert in blah, 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 blah. I say this is your own profile. It's not a bio. Bios are in that third person, are in that, you know, having your name, you know, and saying she or he in the text. So let's step away from that bio, but you still might want to have your own bio for when you need it. And in this um, summary, either strip it of any personal pronouns, kind of like with mine, it just, it, it, it doesn't reference me. It just talks about the skill or actually use the word I. For example, Vita is, is, is being, well, no, actually hers is neutral too. So you you can choose, but I just have a personal preference where I don't like the, the third person. So, okay, are we okay to move on, Michelle? Yes, all set. Oh, great, okay. So we're gonna slip into some of the networking aspects um, but what I'm also going to say, let me take a little tiny pause and say, you have a handout in front of you and there's a 10 point checklist. So when we get into LinkedIn, after we've kind of talked a little bit about networking, if questions come up about something we didn't cover, then um, feel free to say, oh, you know, uh, you know, can you cover number three, customize your public profile, what does that mean? So just know that I'm happy to demo or, or add more detail. Um, <laughs> When I teach LinkedIn, I often will teach a one hour workshop on profile and a one hour workshop on networking. For you today, I'm giving you kind of like the best of those two worlds in a one hour webinar. 
All right, so let's talk the network, developing and growing your network. My philosophy is think broadly about the people that you connect with. Um, some people might say, well, what's the point? I'm an architect. Why should I you know, connect with my brother-in-law who happens to be a chemical engineer? Um, is it really going to? Well, the attitude here is the chemical engineer brother-in-law may actually have someone in their uh, network that's a civil engineer or that happens to be an interior designer or happens to be someone that would be really useful for the architect's career path. So it's not just that person, it's their network and you don't know what's in it. When you're sending an invitation, I always send a personal message. Their name, that personal note, it was great to meet you at last week's conference or whatever it may be, and then the words thank you. You're trying to build rapport, you're trying to uh, be more personable, so take advantage of customizing those invites. Um, this woman, Joanna, actually sent me this message just a few weeks ago, and I said to Joanna, I really love what you wrote, especially how it ends. I look forward to being able to share value with you. So I thought this was a great example about how to reach out to a perfect stranger that you've never met before and ask to connect with them. So this is a really professional, polite, and gracious way to do so. So great job to Joanna. When we start talking about our network, we're going to be talking first, second, third, group. And when we say the word second, let me just make sure everybody's on the same page for this. You probably are. But Michelle and I are first level connections. This means anyone else in Michelle's network would be my second level. And because I know Michelle pretty well, I would feel comfortable if I noticed that I was um, that someone was in her network that I wanted to talk to, I'd feel comfortable enough sending her an email and asking her for an introduction. So those first level connections can be really valuable to reach out to the second level ones. Group are also really valuable. When you belong to the same group as someone else, you can actually message them from a free account. We're going to spend a little time on that. I think that's a best kept secret. So hopefully that'll be the fun, one of the fun things you get a chance to learn and see today. The next thing I want to talk about for building your network is adding updates to your home page. Oh, one of these days I should probably add a poll to this because I'm curious if anybody does it. But I bet you out of our, out of our group, we'll probably have 10% of you actually adding updates to your home page. I think this is an area where you can really grow. Your homepage feed is just like anything else, like a Twitter or a LinkedIn or a, you know any of the social media where you can post things, you can add feedback and comment, you can share them, you can like them. And I thought I would give you a couple of examples so it could kind of come to life and see how it can be useful. Before I show the first one, however, I'm gonna also add what's the point. The point is I stay top of mind to my network when I'm adding content, and I can also help my network by hitting the like and the comment and sharing it with my community. So this was a fun one. I posted, I think it was last week. What I've done here is I just wanted, I'm connected to some other Northeastern alumni, and I wanted people to know if they hadn't already heard through Northeastern directly that this webinar was going on. And what I did here is I tagged Michelle so that she would also be kind of honored or you know, acknowledged for being the one in charge of this whole series. You can see at the time I took the snapshot, there were 20 likes and then there were five comments. So we had a little bit of back and forth with some different people. Another example of sharing comments or updates is um, this one is a very simple, um, make a, like a strategy or a, just a simple, bit of advice. Looking for a job, try to network and trying to network more. Shift gears and think about how you can help or add value for others. Being of service is an amazing way to authentically grow your network. Now, a lot of times I post things and I'll get, you know, maybe five or six likes or maybe 10 likes. This one very quickly got 47 likes. I was quite surprised. And I think it's because it spoke to people and it was also very quick to read. 
And we had a little bit of comments back and forth. So there could be some ways in which you can add value yourself by making some comments about advice for people in your field. And it can be appreciated and shared. Here's one more example. I really liked the blog post that Kathy Robinson wrote. And so I said, looking for a job where you can work from home or work from anywhere, Kathy Robinson has collected some fantastic resources. And I had a lot of people that said, wow, this is really great, you know, and thank you to both Sabrina and to Kathy for sharing this. So I'm wanting to reiterate again that it's really, really nice when you can show off what other people are doing and acknowledge them uh, for that. Okay. We're going to move into groups, and we're also going to talk about uh, informational interviewing. But I'm going to do a, just a very quick check-in if anything else has popped up. Hey, Sabrina, oh. your intuition is good. I've got about four questions here, so I'm just oh, going to okay. take them in sequence. Um, why add friends and family? When employers look at your network, they will see a bunch of people not related to your career. OK. Um, first of all, I don't think people like recruiters are going to look specifically at your network and see, oh my gosh, and judge you in any way because you happen to be connected to people outside your field. Um, I have over 4,000 connections, and so those connections are not in my field. They're all over the place. And I learn so much by reading my homepage about all different industries because of the breadth of the people that I'm connected to. So I am going to just say I'm hopefully dispelling that myth that that could be any kind of issue. And I'll even say on the flip side, if I were targeting a sales or a business development role or some other role that needed to be really highly connected, someone might look at my LinkedIn profile and if they saw I only had 100 connections, they might actually judge it the other way around. Ah, oh, this person's not as connected as they need to be for that role in business development or sales or real estate or whatever it could be. So hopefully I've dispelled that myth. So what else do we have there, Michelle? So what if you're looking for a job in multiple industries? What would you post for updates? Um, multiple industries. I, I will actually post myself in multiple areas. I will see me putting down career related content, interviewing, resume, et cetera, that kind of thing. You'll also see me putting down things about mindfulness, meditation, retreats, um, holistic principles and practices, which can feel really different than content about interviewing. So I, I would actually say it's going to be OK for you to actually share content from multiple industries. I don't think that that's, that's a big problem. But one thing I will say is you have to work a little bit harder when crafting your LinkedIn summary when you're trying to position yourself for multiple industries. Although that's what Jessica was, was doing. She didn't want to just be biotech. She didn't want to just be pharma. Um, you know, so she had both of those on there, as well as just in general the analytics kind of comment on there. So I say work hard to not let um, your summary or other parts of LinkedIn limit you. I don't want people to ever feel boxed in by this tool. All right, do we have one more question? Uh, two more. Um, is LinkedIn premium premium worth it? Great. Oh, so glad I got asked. Um, what I'm going to show you today are workarounds. I have always used a free account. I've never done the premium. Um, so what I would, but I read about it all the time. What's happened recently is the the premium level is sort of not even all that useful. This is what I'm hearing from lots of LinkedIn posts. That if you're going to buy LinkedIn, you kind of need to go to the sales navigator level, which I th which is I think like eighty dollars a month or so for it to be really useful. I would recommend something like Sales Navigator if you are in a field where you really have to reach out for your job to other people. So maybe you're in real estate, maybe you're in insurance sales, um, maybe you are a recruiter, maybe you're an entrepreneur and you need to do a lot of business development. Those are going to be the times when I'm going to say it may very well be useful in the job itself to have a LinkedIn account. But hopefully your employer would pay for it. As a job seeker, 
I teach the workarounds, and my recommendation is to just use the free account. Okay. Do you recommend Sabrina adding people you don't know when they make the request to link? So that's another really, really great question, and it's a very personal decision. I have total respect when some people say to me, you know, Sabrina, I don't want to have a really wide network. I want all the people in my network on LinkedIn to be, to be people I have met or that I, you know, have met briefly or that I know in some capacity. So there are going to be some of you that that's what you choose, um, and that is just fine. I choose a more robust acknowledgement, and I actually, when I run webinars, I welcome all of you to connect with me. And I'll tell you a little bit about why it's valuable for me and what I think the pros and cons are to go wide with your network. The pros, when I post something on LinkedIn, and someone hits the like button, it goes to their, to that person's network, if that makes sense. It lands on that person's homepage. So the more connections I have, then there's more people seeing my content. Therefore, my reputation in this industry can grow. So it helps me with my future sort of networking and growing my reputation and being a kind of a thought leader on certain topics. So that's one of the advantages. A very technical advantage is also that if a recruiter is looking for you, you know, let me rephrase it. If a recruiter is looking for a particular individual and they've typed in some characteristics into LinkedIn in the search mechanism, maybe they're looking for a financial analyst. If you are more than three levels away from that recruiter, first, second, third level connection, you won't show up in their search. So by being connected to more people, at least to that third level, you're going to show up in more people's searches. So it helps you with visibility from a recruiter standpoint or anybody else that's just doing a search in LinkedIn. And it helps you with a reputation growing kind of standpoint. Those are the pros, the negatives. When I say yes to a complete stranger somewhere in the world, um, they have my email address. So what that means is I've gotten on more uh, mailing lists with that email address. So I get a little bit more spam. That's the downfall, and I'm willing to take on the extra spam. And, and I, that's just not something that I worry so much about. Uh, that's my choice. So I'm, you can tell I'm a, a, a pro for saying yes to LinkedIn invitations. Um, the only thing, the only other thing I do need to say is I've had some experiences where people had something, have had a, uh, their account hacked. The person I talked to earlier on, do you remember the example with Jim? He actually, someone hacked into his account and they went into each of his blog posts and added a website link to promote whatever organization they were doing, which I thought was a little bit ridiculous. But you might set up two-step verification to protect your LinkedIn. And um, you can, if, if you need more details, just go LinkedIn two-step verification in a, in a search and the details about how to set it up will come in. All right, so I'm gonna keep moving um, for a bit more because I need to make sure we get through some more topics. And we're gonna shift gears into actually this concept of informational interviews. And then I'm going to show you how you could potentially find people through LinkedIn to do these informational interviews. And I'm wondering, um, maybe I can just throw this actually back to Michelle, since she is a um, fellow career development specialist, has tons of knowledge, I think, um, about networking. What are your thoughts about informational interviews? What, what are these things? Informational interviews are great. I think all career counselors are a big fan of them. It's the idea of reaching out to people in a field that you're considering or in an organization you're trying to make contacts in. The key thing is you're not asking that person to get you a job. You're not asking them about jobs, but you're asking them for information sharing. What is the work that they do? What is it like? Um, how does one get into that field? What are the associations they're involved with? What are the trends going on? 
So it means that you're also getting in front of people and potentially growing your network because they may refer you to other people. And also I find that many job seekers are frustrated when they apply to jobs and hear nothing. And so here you're getting feedback from people about your resume, about your background, about your approach, and you're getting insider information about what's going on in an organization or an industry, and you're getting you know, free advice um, that you're gonna always send a thank you letter for. So it just makes a huge difference and hopefully it's enjoyable. And, and keep in mind that people wanna help, they wanna give back, they wanna help other people with their career development. So most people are willing to make time for them and they should be short, like ask people for a half hour meeting or call at their convenience. Sometimes people even do less time than that. Ah, perfect. I don't think I even have much to add, Michelle. Thank right. You. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, Michelle, I'm such a fan of these. What I, what I tell people is I'm, I'm in a job and yet I still do informational interviews because I love to learn and I love to um, grow my network and, you know, well, I guess also stay on top of trends in my own industry. So it'd be so wonderful if you decided just not even just as a job search tool, but as kind of a way of being that a couple times a year you do an informational and you learn about a new company or you learn about a career path that you might consider someday or you learn more about a group of people that you have to co collaborate with at your own organization, but you, you know, talk to people in other organizations so you can better understand their roles. So let's now kind of jump in um, and we're going to look at groups and how you can find people in LinkedIn through groups to potentially ask. But before we do that, we're going to ask you, are you already in any groups? I'm hoping you're in some Northeastern groups. Michelle and I are both in a bunch of them. Um, so let's put up a poll and find out if you're involved in any groups. And while that's going up, I'm going to jump out of LinkedIn and move our way into um, our next piece here, going into LinkedIn directly. And we've got 22 people in groups and two people that are not. 22 and, oh, hey, all right, we've got lots of people in groups. And I'm just waiting for my screen to play catch up. So hang on a second here. Um, there it goes. And now, jump into actually this is where I'm going to do a quick break into showing you I'm sorry we've got some delay on my laptop um, where I take you is just sabrina-woods.com which is at the top of your handout a sidestep just so that you know there's some additional resources you can click on the LinkedIn button and you can see a copy of the handout is actually right at the top and I'm sorry it's so slow it'll hopefully um, pick back up so this will show you the LinkedIn handout which I update anytime it changes because LinkedIn loves to make changes so that's that very first one right here and I'm guessing Michelle you can see the screen okay yes Right. Okay. The second one down is prep to build a savvy summary. So you can open this up and you can see some questions. So if you're one of those people that doesn't have the summary yet, instead of staring at a blank piece of paper, which we all know can just be kind of dread, dread, right? You can say, all right, let me check out some of these questions, keeping in mind your target, where you're headed, and, you know, sit down and answer some of these first. And then it'll make it a lot easier to do the summary after. Um, there are sample requests to ask for an informational interview in here. And there are um, some sample profile summaries. The one for Jessica is in this section. And <laughs> this might crack you up. Um, I did before after profiles for some scientists. And so if you just get a kick out of before afters, you know, makeovers are all the rage, right? So you can bump, you can jump in here and you can see Yi Chen, her summary in the beginning, very basic, more like um, a couple of bullets about skills, to telling her more full story. So I'll leave it at that because we want to make sure we get back into this poll. I know I'm leaving you hanging with that. 
and we're going to talk about groups, but I wanted you to know that that's available to you to check out. All right, we'll wait for LinkedIn to pop up. And the question we have, and I'll turn it over to Michelle, is, um, oh, we already said, we've got, say those numbers again, it was 19 and then two, didn't? Uh, two people that didn't, didn't use groups. Okay, so we don't really need a lot of time to spend um, on it. I, I'll just say that you can put in a keyword, I'm gonna play with biotech in my next example, so I could put it up here. I can type in biotech, hit the return, and then a drop down menu is going to show up so that I can now choose the more button and I can um, now look for groups. I'm not going to click on it because we don't need to go there right now. So um, I'll also say look at the upper right hand corner. Do you see where it says the word work? And I have my um, cursor over there. You can drop that down to see what your current groups are that you're already in. So I can go here, click on my own groups, and there are lots of Northeastern groups that you that you can join. So when you type on, you can type on uh, Northeastern, you can type on other universities that you've attended. Here's my groups here. And then you can type on industry uh, groups. You can type, look for keywords of just things of interest. So now I can see, let's see some of the Northeastern ones. I'm just trying to scroll down to show you a couple. Um, Northeastern University alumni. There's also Northeastern University networking. Is this the main group, Michelle? Northeastern University alumni? That's the one that you want to join, definitely. This is the biggest one, the main one. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, make sure you join that one if you're not already in it. And then um, Northeastern University networking is another one. Okay. Let's um, Let's go and talk really specifically about trying to do an informational interview because maybe you're making an industry change. The example I'm going to use is my background. I went to Northeastern and studied marketing. And so I was in the marketing communications field for a while before I made a career change. Let's say I wanted to go back to corporate communications or, or some kind of marketing communications role, but I wanted to do it in the biotech sector. So I might have my sights on a certain company, at least even to do an informational interview. And so I'm going to type in, I'm going to type in Santa Fe. Santa, oh, hang on a second, guys. Santa Fe Genzyme. I'm not choosing from the drop-down menu. Instead, I'm hitting Enter right here, so that now I can choose from this drop-down menu. Um, what I want to focus on are people. Okay, and I think it's already showing me that. The next thing I want to show focus on is I'm going to open up to all filters because I'm going to find Northeastern alumni. Okay, and so I can put in school and I can put in industries. I can put in all kinds of different choices along here. But here I can also just, it's a little confusing. School is listed twice. I would come down to the bottom filter and either write Northeastern in here or check this box. Because a North, fellow Northeastern alum is more likely to respond. And I could also add in location because maybe I want to stay, I really want to talk to somebody in person. So, I, and I want to work potentially in biotech in Boston. And I know some of you are all over the place, not everybody's in Boston, but let's just use that as my example. Now my search has gotten down to 558 people by adding in school and adding in Boston. And now I can see I found somebody that says communications. My next step is going to be to see if Hannah and I are connected in a group together. If we are, I can go back into the group and send her a message. This process is a little bit mm, cumbersome, so I'm going to just warn you ahead of time and also share that I've bulleted, bulleted it out on page two of your handout. So if you flip to page two, you will see a, a, a little blurb that says, use search plus your groups to message fellow LinkedIn, LinkedIn members in the free account. 
using an unpaid, not, not a premium. So let's try this process and know that you've got all the instructions um, there as well. Hannah and I are second level. That means I can go see if there's someone I know well enough who knows Hannah to forward an email along, but I might not want to bother my first level connections. So here's my alternate plan. If, I'm going to say again, if we have something in common, it will show up as highlights. I happen to have 12 mutual connections. We both worked at Northeastern and we belong to this Northeastern University networking group together. Again, so I don't have to bother anyone else. What I'm going to do is go into the group and me message her there. But let's pretend for a moment we had no groups in common. Another philosophy is I can scroll all the way down, and I mean all the way down to the very bottom, where I'll see a button that says See All. I bet most of you have never clicked there. Well, this is a little hidden gem because I can see what groups she happens to belong to. Let's pretend she had a marketing communications group or some other Boston group. I could potentially join the group and then I'd have the ability to message her. So you can be savvy with your um, approach to this. It doesn't just have to be people you belong to the same group. Why not jump in and start joining groups that people are in that you want to talk to? The last thing I'll say is, of course, I could try and send her a connection request. But as we know, not everyone says yes to connection requests. You can try it, but you might try this other method um, first. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to grab her name and highlight it. And I'm going to do the control C for copy. And now I'm going to go up to the Northeastern University Networking. I'm going to type that. Now it's actually popped up. So there's the group. When I'm on a page like this, my instinct is to go to where the magnifying glass is, where the search is in the upper right hand corner. However, that little search button will only search the content of the group, meaning it'll only check out discussions. So instead, what I have to do, best kept secret on LinkedIn, is hover over the number of members, and now you can see that it highlights. That's going to give me a new screen, and it's going to give me the ability to find a member. I drop in Hannah's name. Now, I'm sorry, my screen's a little small. There we go. Now I can actually send her a message. This is where I craft a nice message about how we are both, you know, um, fellow Northeastern alums, and I found her in an alumni group on LinkedIn, and then I would be really interested to hear more about her work at Santa Fe Genzyme, and I'm going to look at her profile, and I'm going to hopefully find some genuine comments, genuine kindness that I can, you know, um, feedback, positive feedback that I can share with her. And maybe I do a one-liner about myself and then ask if she would be up for um, speaking a little bit to learn about her role and advice about being in the Marcom community, but within the biotech industry. So that's how you can go about it. I'm going to pull up Northeastern University's webpage as well, the career development, because you can see there's information in here about networking and informational interviewing. So just know that you've got some resources here as well as resources on my website for how to actually do the ask. And, you know, there's this LinkedIn for job search handout is here as well, which I wrote when I was there. I'm sure it looks a little different now. Um, and then more about informational interviewing. So know that you've got that resource as well. So this is just one of my favorite ways to use LinkedIn to be able to message people. Um, we have about five or six more minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you one more tool. And then for the last couple of minutes, we'll take questions. The last tool is on your handout. It says, look for alumni. You can actually, besides using the search method I just used to find alumni and adding in the word school, you can go directly to the school. So I'm going to go Northeastern University. I'm going to hit the more button. 
I'm not going to go to the company page. I'm not going to go to the group page. Instead, the key here is that you go to the schools page. And here it is, Northeastern University. Now I've got a cool button that says see alumni. Let's pop this open. And what you're going to find is new ways in which you can um, slice the data. If, for example, you were moving to another city, you could go in here and you could say, oh, I'm moving to San Francisco, and you could highlight that. Down below, you see the 5,400 alumni who live in San Francisco. I could add another caveat. I could add, oh, I want to see people who have, happen to work at Intuit, or I'm really interested in business development. There's a few more options over here. Sorry about that. You go to the next button. You could choose a particular major. Hey, go find your major in particular and see where people have ended up or a skill set. Lots of different ways in which you can play with this data. Let's, let's go with my, my old major. So if I decided I wanted to return to marketing and move to San Fran, then there are 258 alums down here that I could reach out to. The other really nice thing to keep in mind is you can combine LinkedIn with the alumni directory. So I might get Jamie's background from LinkedIn. I love Airbnb, so maybe I'd like to find out what her experience is like at Airbnb. I get her background from LinkedIn, and then I can message her, message her through the alumni, the Northeastern alumni directory. So really great to use both those resources. And this is also, you know, a nice advantage of being from a really large school with so many people in these successful type roles. You have an amazing network out there because of that and one that you probably haven't fully tapped. And my hope for you and Michelle's hope for you is that this helps you better connect, um, helps you advance your career, helps you make some, um, some headway because of these individuals that are out there that are doing these amazing things. Okay. We have a few more minutes, and I'd love to turn it back to Michelle to see what else you're curious about, and also remind you that you're invited to connect with me on LinkedIn, and if you ever get stuck, or if you don't get your question answered today, shoot me a quick message. I really don't mind. It's how I give back, and it also helps me to know what you're struggling with, so I can learn new workarounds when people can't do something on LinkedIn. So feel free to flag me when you're, when you're having trouble finding something. And Michelle. You know, we have a question. I've been trying to cold message people that I would like to talk to for informational interviews by using InMail and have been mostly unsuccessful. Is this usual or might I be doing something wrong? Okay. I probably need to know more information. But first of all, I'll say the, the phrase InMail means that someone has a premium account and you get in, um, a certain number, like five or ten or more um, messages that you could send to anyone on LinkedIn. So just wanted to clarify what InMail was. Um, the next thing I'm going to say is your response rate is going to vary by a lot of different factors. Um, if somebody is in an extremely fast-paced, intense, people working 100 hours a week kind of a field, you're going to be really low on that person's priority. If it is one of those extremely competitive industries, you're going to have a stronger yes rate if you can find a first level connection that knows that person. Meaning like you're asking your immediate network, um, do they know someone? Like use the first level connection to reach the second level by introduction from that person. That's going to be the first thing I'm going to say. The next thing is, the closer they are to you, the more you have in common, the more likely they are to say yes. So someone who's not an alum and not in your city and not in your field, they're really distant. So if they are an alum and maybe you um, even did a, did a Northeastern club in common, like I was on the crew team at Northeastern, if I found someone that also was on crew, even a different year, I got two things in common. So the more commonalities, the better. The third thing I'll say is how you craft your message can really make a difference. 
if you send me a message requesting an informational interview and your message is all about you, I'm going to be turned off. Instead, if you were to send me a message and it was giving genuine compliments and being really interested in some things from my past and my current work, and you wove it together in a, in a you know, simple but, but um, well-written, crafted message, I'm going to be more likely to say yes. If that message can be more specific for why you want to talk to that person, because you've done startup as well as large corporate, you'd be an amazing person to speak to, then that's also going to help you have an edge. So I know I took a long time in answering that question, um, but we also have to have a little bit of armor and say, hey, no big deal. Sometimes people won't get back to us. I'm going to go on and find more people to talk to. Find 10 some night, send out 10 requests, and maybe you hear back from two or three of them and let that be okay. Um, do we have time for one more question, Michelle? I know it's 1 o'clock right now. I've got to respect people's time. Just really quickly, someone said that LinkedIn is, they're getting some sort of pop-up messages from LinkedIn saying these are people who can give career advice. This person's asked them, um, reached out to these people, but haven't gotten any advice from them. Have you come across this feature? So it's funny. I, I, I think features sometimes roll out at different times. And I don't have that feature yet. Oh, I wish we had. A, we, I wish we could do a poll. Michelle, do you have that feature yet? Because some people are not have it. familiar with it. Okay, so I don't know that it's rolled out to everyone yet. I've read articles about it, but I haven't actually seen it. So I'm. I'm going to say I'm a little bit too new to this to know how to respond because I haven't been able to play with it yet. Um, the person who wrote that send me a message on LinkedIn so that once I have more of an answer, it might be a few weeks, who knows when I'll get the tool, I will respond to you once I actually have an answer. How's that? Great. Um, all right. So actually a very last question about if a company doesn't seem to be actively hiring at the moment, as in they don't have job listings, is it okay to message the HR person on LinkedIn to express your interest and inquire about opportunities? Oh, sure. I think recruiters are really, um, for the most part, receptive. And you send a nice message that just says, you know, so interested in your organization. While there's nothing um, that's appropriate for me right now, I would really enjoy being connected to you and staying abreast of um, what's happening in your organization and following your successes. Things like that would be great to say. Fantastic question. And I just put up a, a you know, five next steps that you can consider doing if it helps you kind of thinking about, oh, what, what can I do to kind of keep this, um, keep it simple for what I've learned today and actually take some action on some things. So great. Um, thank you so much for having me, Michelle. It's really been great to talk to fellow alums. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Um, there's been some really nice thank you comments being written in the chat box here from attendees. Oh. <laughs> I'm grateful for all the good tips you're sharing, and I know I've learned some new things. So the key thing, as you said, is for people to take this great advice and implement a few things this week that you learned here today. And um, Sabrina, it's an honor to have you here as our expert, and I really appreciate the really good handout and the really good information. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise, and thanks, everybody, for joining us and asking wonderful questions. Great. Thanks again, Michelle, and everyone else. Let me know how I can help. Thanks, everyone.